Good morning, church. In my library, I have a little book called Communings in the Sanctuary by Robert Richardson, who was one of the early restoration folks on the American frontier. And uh, he worked with the church in Bethany, West Virginia, along with Alexander Campbell and others. And uh, Richardson actually was a physician. And uh, he did a lot of the communion talks when the church met. And uh, in those days, you know, 200 years ago, communion talks were probably twice as long as I'm going to talk this morning. And then the sermons were probably three times as long as I'm going to talk this morning. So they took a long time on communion and a, a long time in the Word, and, and they had a little more patience than we do today. We probably wouldn't tolerate that long, but uh, very um, excellent uh, thoughts on the Lord's Supper and, and so forth. And I just I reflected on that this morning because I thought um, Mark's talk there a few minutes ago was so good and, and illustrated so well, and I'm just impressed each week as different ones get up and, and lead in communion, the same thing, original thoughts, helping us think about these important things. Um, and Mark, I may need to borrow that tool here in a couple of years, actually, so I thought about my fence. But uh, it's good to be together. Uh, good to see you here. We have uh, guests with us. We hope you feel welcome and invite you into the Word of God this morning for a few minutes. Again, uh, with a little story about a golfer who had a lifelong ambition. He lived on the West Coast, and, and he uh, played uh, the Pebble Beach California golf course quite often, which is very exclusive and uh, beautiful course. You see a picture of it here, I believe. Yes. And, uh, but he wanted to play that course. He was an amateur. He wanted to play that co course in this particular hole that you see a photo of the way the pros play it. And that is the pros will drive the ball out over the water onto this green that's on a little spit of land that juts off the coast. And he had tried that uh, many times through the years without success. And his ball never made it. It always fell into the ocean, fell short. And so he developed the practice uh, when he played that hole to never use a new ball. Now this is a, if you don't know golf, this is a typical trick of golfers. If you're afraid you're gonna hit it in the water or someplace else where you won't be able to retrieve it, use an old dirty ball, a cut ball or something like that. You know, Steve does that quite a bit. But um, that's what he would do on this particular hole. And, um, but he always wanted to play it legit, you know, and so, one time he went back to Pebble Beach to try again. He came to this fateful hole and he, he teed up an old cut ball as was his practice. And this time he said a silent prayer. And before he hit the ball, a powerful voice from above said, wait, replace that old ball with a brand new ball. And he complied because it seemed the Lord was implying that he was going to let him finally play the hole like um, he had wanted to his entire life. And so put the new ball down, and he stepped up to the tee once again, and the voice came down again. And it said, wait, step back and take a practice swing. So he stepped back and, and took a practice swing. And the voice boomed out again, wait, take another practice swing. And he did. And then there was silence. And then the voice spoke out again, put back the old ball. <laughs> you see, God can see all our flaws, even our bad swings. But despite that, he still works with us. He still calls us into his service. He still offers us a home with him one day, despite our imperfections. And for that reason, 
we worship him today. This morning I want to do something that uh, pretty confident has, has rarely been done in the church. Fellas, if you can advance the slide, just go right ahead. There we go. Uh, probably has pre- been r- rarely done in the church. Uh, it, although you've had really good preachers here up till now, so maybe it has been done here. Um, but I just haven't experienced it that much. Today I want to begin a series of messages from the New Testament letter of Jude. Uh, Jude is not a book that we turn to very often. There's really one famous verse uh, in the book that I've heard quoted all my life, but beyond that, really precious little preaching or study done from it. It's just a little one-chapter book that's tucked at the end of your New Testament between the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then that famous last book of the canon, the book of Revelation. So Jude is just sort of tucked in there between those more well-known books. And it's just 25 brief verses. Uh, Jude is, is really like a typical first century letter. If you could see, have seen mail in the first century, this is what they look like. Very brief, short, to the point and you sort of have a greeting at the beginning and then a brief um, message in the middle of the body and then a concluding wish of some sort. And that's what we get uh, in the book of Jude. I think we're poorer for not including Jude in our preaching and teaching through the years. I find in in reading Jude that he is particularly relevant in the culture in which we live, a culture that flirts with a very generic spirituality. Uh, it, It sort of flirts with that kind of spirituality, but it largely rejects morality and ethics. Jude has something to say about the uh, do-whatever-feels-good mentality of our times. And we will get to that in uh, the next couple of messages that we bring from this letter. Today I just want to introduce the study to you and, and sort of make a request of you as we go through this series over basically this, this month that you take some time each week and read Jude. Again, just 25 verses. Only takes a few minutes, and you can uh, read clear through it. Just each week, uh, if you'll read it, take the time to read it, you'll become pretty familiar with its content, and I believe um, have a, a grasp of it by the end of the month, and I think God will bless you with spiritual growth along the way. Let's just ask a a couple of basic questions today. Who was Jude? And who were these people that he was writing to? That's basically what what we want to ask. Who was Jude? Well, the letter begins in this one way. If we go to the slide with the first verse on it. Begins, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, and brother of James. Now, most every translation that you might be looking at this morning will say a servant of Jesus Christ, and that's a fine way to translate it, but the word originally meant slave. So we at least know this about who Jude was. He was a servant or a slave of Jesus. That's how he described himself as he opened his letter. Now, that's interesting to me because the the preponderance of the evidence points to the fact that Jude was, in actuality, that Judas that's mentioned in the Gospels, both in uh, Mark chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 13, as one of the four younger brothers of Jesus. 
Uh, you might remember the list that both Matthew and Mark give us of the brothers of the Lord, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. Jesus had these four younger brothers. And, and you remember perhaps the fact that early on, Jesus' physical family, his earthly family, was really not on board with his agenda. They were not his disciples at first. Um, they, they, they really went around um, and along with most of the crowd in Nazareth, which was their hometown, in being pretty perplexed with Jesus. Uh, this, this trained carpenter from, from Nazareth who's gaining all this fame and attention throughout the land, and they're a bit bothered by it. They, they remain unconvinced of, of his claims. This includes his family, his brothers. And maybe we would expect earthly brothers to behave that way in a situation like this, a little sibling rivalry, perhaps. You might remember the story that... Uh, that we read in the, in the book of Genesis, Joseph and his brothers, where there was this kind of thing, Joseph being a younger brother whom God is appearing to in dreams. And, and, and these dreams implied that all his brothers would one day bow down to him and serve him. They really didn't take too kindly to that idea, did they? That bothered them. In fact, it... Um, drove them to do some pretty wicked things. Well, early on, it was the same way with the brothers of Jesus. But something had changed. By the time Jude puts pen to paper and writes these words, there's no longer this rivalry. Um, there's no more petty jealousies or whatever it may have been. There's no more doubt in Jude. In fact, if you look again at the opening words of his letter, Jude will not even go so far as to claim to be the brother of Jesus, will he? If you were writing a document in the first century to, to Christian churches and you wanted their attention, don't you think it would have been to your advantage to remind them I was the brother of I was one of the brothers of Jesus, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he calls himself the slave of Jesus. The slave. Folks, that only happens because of the cross and the resurrection. Uh, James was another one of those brothers. And if you if you look at the, the book of James, when he opens his book, likewise, he doesn't claim to be the brother of the Lord. He doesn't use that boast. Um, other people described him that way, Paul being one, but not James. James will not call himself the brother of the Lord, and, and not Jude here. They claim only to be slaves, servants of Jesus. I wonder today, in the times we live in, if we can be that humble. Would we dare to call ourselves the slaves of anyone or anything in our day and age? I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but did you ever wonder why almost no English translation of the Bible translates this word, slave, when that is clearly what the word meant when it was written? They will usually insert servant and then a foot, perhaps a footnote, and then in small print at the bottom, it will say, oh, this word meant slave. Ever wonder why that's the case? It's always softened to servant, never slave. Well, it's a concept 
that we free people have an awful time swallowing, right? We have sacrificed too much. We've come too far, shed too much blood for our freedom to be slaves to anyone. But you see, Jude, he was a free man too. So was James and Paul and Peter and John. They were all free, and yet they all referred to themselves as doulos esu Christu, slaves of Jesus Christ. And at least in the case of James and, and Jude, they could have said brothers of Jesus. I believe it takes someone who is very secure in, in their place and in their relationship to call themselves the servant or the slave of someone else. So I think security is the theme of this opening of Jude here in the first couple of verses. See, we have it all messed up in, in this world. We're taught to think that it shows weakness or insecurity to be a servant. When the fact is that only really strong really secure people can actually be real servants. You really have to know who you are and what you're all about to call yourself the slave of Jesus Christ. Especially, you know, if you're in the situation where you had every right to, to call him your brother. Now Jude goes on in the rest of his greeting here to describe the people that he's writing to. Uh, he, he had described himself, slave of Jesus Christ. Now he turns to describe his audience. And again, the emphasis is on security. So look at these next words. He writes, to those beloved in God the Father, to those kept for Jesus Christ, to the called. To the loved, to the kept, and to the called. Those three terms describe secure people. The loved, the kept, the called. People who are spiritually safe and sound. These terms describe real Christianity. Christian life begins and ends with the love of God, of course. For God so loved the world. His love created us. His love rescued us. And his love will one day grant us a place with him in eternity. A place prepared for his followers. Christian cannot escape the love of God. Scripture asks us, Romans chapter 8, for example. What, what shall separate us from the love of God? Do you remember what the answer is in that chapter? What shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. And then Jude describes secure Christians as kept. Underline that word. One translation says preserved. But the idea, again, is security. That God has the ability to keep us safe. Spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking. He has the ability to keep us safe, to protect us. We are not intended to live on spiritual pins and needles, folks. Um, wondering whether we're saved or not every moment. That is not true Christianity. Oh, I had a bad day today. 
I'm lost today. Tomorrow will be better. I'll be saved tomorrow. No. Not according to Scripture. Jesus prays in his great prayer, John chapter 17, that the, the Father would keep those he left behind in the world. That's what he prayed to the Father to do, to keep them. Peter writes about Christians, describing them as those who, quote, by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation. 1 Peter 1, verse 5. This is throughout the New Testament. We understand and appreciate God's power and grace being sufficient for our conversion, okay, and even for our ultimate salvation one day, but Jude reminds us here that God's power is a power that preserves as well. We are being kept, guarded by God spiritually. Then, of course, Jude describes those he's writing to as the called. The called. Again, another security word. Christians are a people called out of darkness. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And then elsewhere in the New Testament, Christians are described as called to be saints. Called according to God's purpose. And called to belong to Jesus Christ. Christians are called people. Loved, kept, and called. All words that describe security. Security in God. Security in Jesus Christ. Secure in faith. Secure in eternity. True spiritual security. Something that will never go bankrupt. Because it is kept. It is guarded by the God of the universe. See, with a God and with a Savior that offers that, it is easy to say, yes, I am his slave. I am his servant. And, and you see, the thing is, that is not the same as saying, I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. That is not the same thing. What it says is, my status comes from him. My identity, my our culture, is struggling with identity. But the Christian can say, my identity comes from Jesus, it comes from the one I serve. My worth comes from God, who thought so much of me that he sent his son to die for me. To be his slave is a high calling. There's nothing higher in this world than to be able to say, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, as you go on in the rest of this letter, all this security that we've emphasized this morning as in this look at the opening, all this security is going to be in sharp contrast to the troublemakers that Jude is dealing with. Like all the other New Testament letters, there's a reason he wrote it. There was something going on that he's addressing and there are these troublemakers, people who had infiltrated the church and appeared on the outside. They appeared to be the most secure, the most confident people around. Sometimes that's a facade, folks. Sometimes that's not real. And these people appeared to be the strongest, most confident people, and yet Jude describes their lives as total chaos. That's in comparison to the true servants of God. They have a, a security that cannot be shaken. 
Now, I hope that that describes your life today. I really do. That you are secure in Christ. I hope it's not the case with, with anybody who is a, a believer this morning, who is a Christian this morning, that they're sort of, well, I might go to heaven if the Lord comes on the right day. No, folks. You were offered true security in Jesus Christ. If you're in Jesus, you're safe. It's the one safe place, safe space in this world. If you're outside of them, there is no safety. But I ask believers, followers of Jesus this morning, are you secure enough that you can describe yourself as his son? as his true servant. I ask you to think about that today. I encourage you again to read the rest of Jude's words as we, Lord willing, talk about this again next week. Let's bow together. Holy God, thank you for your day that you've called us to worship and remember your son and Thank you for all the encouragement and strength that we have been able to, to gather this morning. We pray, Father, we know we're all at different places in our life. We have different needs and, and, and things that might be troubling us. Please give us a sense of your calling and the security we can have in you. Father, if we're not yet in, in that place of safety, we pray for courage to obey your son. Thank you for your love. Help us as we go out to serve others now, uh, wherever we might live, that we can be good witnesses to the resurrection and to the salvation that's offered. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to stand now and sing with Mike again. If we can help you in some way this morning in your response to God. Thank you.